Thank you, Ms. Chapman. Here to provide us with an idea of the demographics that make up our coastal communities is Dr. Ashley Ross. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Marine and Coastal Environmental Sciences at Texas A&M Galveston. A political scientist by training, her research explores hazard and disaster issues from a social political perspective, and she joins us from, again, the very campus in which we're meeting. Dr. Ashley Ross, thank you. Thank you so much for um, allowing me to have this opportunity to join you today in this important conversation about environmental justice. The work that all of you are doing is critical for advancing the well being of coastal communities across our state. And I want to continue this discussion that Colonel Bell started for us this morning by posing the question of justice for whom. What I know as a social scientist is that environmental justice should be understood as a social movement toward a social goal. It is sustained action in support of a shared value. This value has been articulated by the Environmental Protection Agency as one that is fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income. Critically, working towards environmental justice means we address the unequal distribution of environmental harms and benefits. And this is done by not only recognizing and identifying those disparities, but also evaluating whether the procedures and impacts of environmental decision making are fair to the people that they affect. So I'd like to unpack this a bit more for coastal Texas. Years of research and evidence has shown that social inequalities exist across race and income when we're dealing with natural and environmental hazards. Examples of this that are um, studies done in our state of Texas includes the issue of flooding, a recent study um, found that black and Hispanic residents were found to disproportionately experience flooding in areas outside the 100 year floodplain as a result of Hurricane Harvey. This also gets at mitigation to redu reduce natural hazard risk. A study of 2,400 miles of Houston roadside found that communities of color are more likely to have open ditch systems while higher income, more affluent, and white neighborhoods often have closed underground storage, storm drainage systems. And as we all know, those open ditch systems are problematic because they're limited in their ability to discharge stormwater, thereby putting people and property in harm's way. And these inequalities also extend to the damages suffered from environmental hazards and disasters. This includes the health disparities that exist for minority communities um, in our state because they are located near, um, closer and, and more proximate to environmental hazards, but it also includes um, damages suffered from natural hazards and disasters. A study of Galveston found that after Hurricane Ike, poor and minority communities or neighborhoods on the island actually experienced greater damages than more affluent and white neighborhoods, even when controlling for housing age, proximity to water and flood zone. The point being, this is a compelling body of evidence that when we're talking about these inequalities, it shouldn't be considered abstract. This is affecting people in communities across our coast and the state of Texas. And these inequalities are centered on social vulnerabilities. The way that we can define social vulnerabilities is that there are characteristics of a person or group in terms of their capacity to anticipate, cope with, resist, and recover from the impacts of a crisis, whether that's economic or a public health crisis or a disaster caused by a natural hazard. 
all of you in this room know we have a number of sophisticated tools to map social vulnerabilities. And it includes those like the CDC Social Vulnerability Index that I'm showing for the city of Houston on this slide. And while these are important for capturing on a spatial level and uh, widely accepted indicators of this capacity to cope, these tools aren't enough to understand who is vulnerable and who should be the focus of environmental justice initiatives. And they're not sufficient because demographics are only proxies for vulnerability. They do not tell us why people are vulnerable. And this is critically important. Understanding inequities requires that we understand the politics at play. In the 1930s, Her Harold Laswell defined politics as who gets what, when, how. And this definition continues to ring true today and can help us to answer why communities like the colonia in this picture um, are vulnerable and experience disproportionate effects of hazards. We know that Texas colonias, for example, emerged during the 1950s and 60s as agriculture markets in South Texas collapsed. Property was sold to, or farming and agriculture property was sold to real estate developers who in turn sold these small plots of land to families that were looking to um, build homes. And many low income immigrant families bought these plots and built homes, even though they were outside of the city limits, had limited public services, and were in areas that were designed to flood. The politics and the legacies that um, come into play here that we have to deal with today is that these vulnerabilities are perpetuated by not addressing the root causes. And we have to think about how these social vulnerabilities are further compounded by limited political recourse of the residents of Colonias and limited political will of decision makers to make changes. If we travel up from South Texas to urban center of Houston, we can see other examples of this where politics is at play with inequities. The city of Houston has had a history of deed restrictions that have separated development by race and income across the city. And this has pushed minority communities into less desirable areas where property costs are lower. These areas are also where natural and environmental hazards are higher. And this includes the Greens Point area of the city that lies along, the Gre along Greens Bayou. As reported by Texas House, Housers recently, Arbor Court Apartments is, was a project-based Section 8 apartment complex in the Greens Point neighborhood of Houston. And despite repeated flooding, including the tax day flood shown in this picture, um, the federal government continued to subsidize the rent for tenants living there. And in 2018, tenants sued HUD and through a settlement, they were allocated housing choice vouchers and able to move. The problem is that while some of them were able to improve the conditions in which they lived in, others were not, and the inequalities perpetuate for some. To support sustained action to addressing these types of inequalities in our coastal communities and taxes, we have to change who gets what, when, and how. And that means we have to work to remove systematic barriers to equity in terms of the distribution of environmental benefits. This can involve improving deliberative processes that offer equity and diversity in decision making. It is critical to integrate the voices of marginalized groups in decision making, but it's equally important to require that those that hold power and authority in these decision making spaces are held accountable to those voices and to integrating them. So not just offering the opportunity but making sure that it, individuals that are in decision-making authority are held accountable for 
integrating that into the actual process and actions. We should also consider how to invest and engage in capacity building across multiple fronts. On the social front, this includes recognizing and addressing the needs of social vulnerable people and communities in our state. But even more so, we should also evaluate the consequences of changes made. So here what I'm pushing forward is that things like mitigation projects, once they're implemented, should be evaluated in terms of the distribution of environmental benefits and understanding if harm has shifted. It may have just shifted to a different place. We also can look um, on an, a local governance level where there's needs to improve technical skills of individuals and small local government organizations. They are on the front lines of dealing with environmental and natural hazards. There's also a need for unified management schemes that connect local initiatives and reduce this patchwork of mitigation in our coastal communities. And then finally, we can look towards our own institutions Think about how we can enhance equity and justice within our own organizations and how we can promote conversations across agencies that are focused on how to identify and remove those systematic barriers to environmental justice, particularly as it relates to environmental and natural hazard risk for marginalized groups. So supported by these strategies and others, I think that we can make progress in working together so that we are moving forward with environmental justice in our state. So in answer to justice for whom, it should be for each one of the people that are saddled with more environmental burdens and less environmental benefits than others in our communities. So thank you for letting me engage in this conversation with you all, and I, I look forward to your comments and feedback. Uh, no questions I have here. Hi, Robin Calcimo from Army Civil Works. Um, I guess I just want to kind of pull out a couple things and you may not have a response, but just from a thinking standpoint, totally appreciate everything you say, but one underpinning of this is at what level of government? Sure. Right. So there are um, the, the federal government by and large is designed to incentivize behavior by and large. The core is a different animal. I'll talk to that later today, but it's designed to incentivize, but yet the largest problem is from my view, particularly around water and natural hazards it has a lot to do with who owns the land. Sure. And so what is unique about your views in terms of or what's different and what you see there in, in Texas, um, given that kind of scale of government, wh whether you're incentivizing and yet the local level really controls a lot of the land use and sort of you see playing it out, particularly in post disaster world, not response, but recovery. And that sure. seems to be where the most opportunities are missed in my view. And I'm just interested to see what no, your I, research says. I agree that recovery is hard um, in the sense of missed opportunities because what ends up happening is that window of opportunity for really innovative action is small and then we get into these overlapping hazards and disaster cycles where recovery is just stretched out and that's particularly true in texas um, i would say in the gulf coast region overall and i agree with you that the question should be at what level. That's why the, one of the points made is engage in these conversations across agencies, and I would say even across levels of government about how to uh, promote environmental justice initiatives. I, I really do think FEMA is on the right track with presenting it as a lens of equity. If we can all start looking at issues in that way, and we have that common and shared lens, that common and shared value of environmental justice, it then becomes about collaboration. So yes, it's about incentivizing behaviors 
from perhaps the top down. But, you know, that takes understanding and talking about these issues in the same frame so that action can come from the bottom up as well. And so that's, that's not a complete answer. I'm sorry. Um, I think that a lot of it really does hinge on collaboration among government agencies, but also among private and public sectors. Apparently green's the color I need to pay attention to. Um, so that's great. So um, one thing I guess I would encourage folks to be thinking about over the day is just the challenge of the policy window closing yeah. as you enter recovery and folks focus less on how to bring programs together to accomplish things progressively, right? right. And that's where things drop off instead. Yeah. And, and so that's, to me, the, the benefit of an EJ lens is keeping focused on what you can do versus what you, not what you can't do. So the perfect's the enemy, the good kind of a conversation. I agree completely. And I think that it can keep that window open a bit. And it also shifts expectations, right? And it shifts expectations and it takes a while to develop and, and uh, programs that are effectively in response to the types of inequities we're talking about. If we're talking about decades and of historical and political legacies, that doesn't get unraveled overnight. And so it really does take these conversations about how are things distributed? How's risk distributed? How are these benefits of our environment distributed? And that we need to take our time to develop programs that really can make a difference in, in changing that and improving it. Yeah, so I'll just use it as a, a general thank you and, and reemphasize, you know, why it was so important for you to lead off kind of this conversation is your point about collaboration to me is a point about integration. Um, and that's how I couple Robin's comments about at what level um, and, and who's doing what is right now. We don't even know how to communicate the same language to each other. Um, so what you're going to do, I mean, even in this room, you, you've got county commissioners um, that largely represent some of those pictures that we saw on the screen from Hidalgo County. And they don't even know how to start that conversation. They know what they need. They know what justice means uh, and, and are on board. But, but how do we start that conversation? How are we creating the same language so that we can understand how to create and what integration truly means so that we're leveraging every level of government at the appropriate level, time and place? So I think that's a huge kickoff for, for the whole day. So thank you. And if I may, I would just like to add, and it wasn't reflected in my comments of the presentation, that an important part of that isn't uh, just levels of government. And so what I consider to be the public side of it it's private, but it's also civic. So a lot of organizations exist already on the ground. I'm thinking particularly in the Rio Grande Valley that have connections to vulnerable groups that understand how to connect with them, how to talk with them, and then can be representative of their voices. I'm thinking of Valley Interfaith, I'm thinking of Lupe and other organizations in, in the region, and you can find similar organizations across the coast and engaging them and giving them a space in this collaboration, I believe is also critical. We have a, uh, a question online. Uh, actually, they're asking for your comments here. Can you comment on how current and past benefit cost ratio calculations have led to underinvestment in areas with lower property values because civil works decisions were made based on protecting higher property values? Well, that's a big question. I think someone could write a dissertation about that, right? Um, I would say that um, in, in general, when we think about protecting higher property values, again, that's that, that very broad definition that I use as my working definition of understanding politics and policy. We need to ask who is getting what, when, and how. And what we're really pushing today is to look at that through the lens of are there disparities there? So where property values or property that's higher valued, be, is it being protected more by levies than others? We need to be thinking about the distribution of the equity of risk mitigation for communities that um, are have lower property values is what I would say. So I know that that doesn't fully answer the question. Um, no, but I can help a little bit too, right? So that's, again, why we're here today is, 
you know, just as we have moments and times after a disaster to affect, you know, broad change, um, we have a moment in time, you know, largely built on the, the executive orders from this administration under Justice 40 and a reemphasis from this administration on environmental justice and social justice, coupled with kind of the guidelines that we need to think beyond the benefit to cost ratio. Quite honestly, right now, we just don't, you know, we don't have the coordination, the integration and or the layers of government, and we haven't spelled out how that fits to really evaluate the other societal effects that are going to lead us to decision making beyond traditional economic analysis. Absolutely. But we're on the cusp of that. And it's it really gets at thinking about environmental benefits beyond what we can put a dollar amount on. So um, how it provides sustainable livelihoods for people, how it provides cultural and, and spiritual services as well, or, or benefits. Uh, no more questions. Thank you, Dr. Ross. Thank you so much for enlightening us and thank you, Colonel Bell, for making that point. But could we not incorporate the triple bottom line concept in the decision making process where you'd look at the financial, environmental and, jo and social mm -hmm. as one of the method methodologies to make decisions based on instead of just the BCA. And it would be as simple as, as just incorporating the other elements and possibly being able to to serve those areas that today cannot be served because of the formulas in place that are used to evaluate what we want and need. I would say absolutely, that's an important point. And it again gets back to what Colonel Bell's point that we're developing what those, those social formulas can be, you know, if I may call them that. And how do we put indicators and values onto it in a way that truly expresses um, the vulnerability that exists. So where resilience needs to be built up for people and the benefit that um, that is, is of consequence of that action. And so I think it's a challenge, right, for us to continue to think about how we can quantify those things, codify them, um, and then it also does, I think, get back to decision making in the sense we have to have the shared value that we may not always be able to put a formula or a quantification on the social benefits, but we do all care about it. Yeah, I think the only thing I'll add, just because we're at Texas A&M, um, <laughs> and um, I appreciate everything the university is doing. Because we've got a long history of collaboration with universities to try and understand this. We've advanced the science of coastal science um, with Texas A&M, um, as, as our opening speaker alluded to. But also there's something going on right now is, look, there's, a, there's an amazing amount of data that's out there. We, we study and we measure everything, both before a storm and after a storm. And technology allows us to present that data in a visual way that everybody can start to understand it. So one of the initiatives that I'm most excited about that Texas A&M is looking at is looking at the core's data. So the core looks at data specifically and measures benefits in a certain way. Well, underneath kind of this expanded aperture of of of, of understanding of of justice of in that regard, there's a way of looking at that data and making a broader argument to some extent, particularly to policymakers that are interested in, in guiding these, these kind of reforms for justice. So one example of what Texas A&M is looking at is looking at what the core traditionally measures in terms of structures, right? I go back to that picture of Hidalgo County. Straight up, that structural value in that photograph, I don't know, Ashley, if you actually, if y'all can actually go back to that picture, we're having a bit of technical difficulty. That's right, but you, you guys can understand. So the courts, if, if you go back to that mental image of that picture in Hidalgo County, structurally, it doesn't look like there's a tremendous amount of value. All right, so that's what we're measuring is what is the value of that property that is being inundated? Right there and then tells you, well, that's a starting point. Let's look at what we're measuring because we have a measurement for everything in that photograph right now. And right now we measure that in terms of value lost during inundation. 
from the physical side. We're not measuring that person that's right in the middle of that photograph right now. That individual is a person that is part of a community. That community represents a major sector of the economy. How long is it gonna take until that person in that community is mobilized, re, uh, that, that whole community is back up and running and that economy is back up and running? And what is the societal and the economic cost of having that individual displaced for two months, three months, or permanently, never to return? And there's ways to look at and use the data that we're already measuring and expanding the way we define that. I think that's the challenge that's ahead of us right now. And I think, um, you know, there are specific efforts from this university to try to codify that as the rehabilitation costs of, of, of the impacts of a disaster so that we can measure that from a broader economic scale. Um, so that's kind of exciting in terms of what's taking place right now. 